Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Where the 99 Leads. I'm Andrew Joyce, your host, and Where the 99 Leads, it refers to the historic 99 steps that lead to the University of Pikeville campus, and more importantly, lead from campus into the community, into the region, and into the world. On Where the 99 Leads, we talk many different subjects on this program over the years, athletics, academics, new programs, new degrees, old programs, uh, historic programs, award-winning programs, and uh, joined by a guest today that has been on the program before, Amanda Runyon, Assistant Professor of English. And Amanda, welcome back to the show. Thank you, it's always a pleasure to be here. It is indeed. You have a great passion and love for uh, literature. We're gonna talk about that today. We're gonna talk about a renewed publication at the University of Pikeville. But before we do, let's talk about your background and uh, your role at the University of Pikeville. You wear many different hats. I do. Um, I am an assistant professor of English. I teach composition courses and I teach Appalachian literature and I also teach uh, first year studies. I coach our academic team. Yes. And most recently I became the co-editor of the Pikeville Review, which is right. our new publication. Um, I'm a graduate of what was then Pikeville College. Sure. I graduated there with a degree in English and I got a master's degree at Moorhead State University. And I'm currently working on an MFA in fiction and creative writing at West Virginia Wesleyan College. Very good. And where do you call home? Uh, Draffin, Kentucky, which yeah, is right. near Elkhorn City. Yes. And you grew up and attended high school? That's right, at Elkhorn City. Mm -hmm. Home of the Cougars. That's right. It and, doesn't uh, exist anymore. And gateway to the breaks, beautiful Elkhorn City, yeah. Kentucky. It's one of our favorite parts and a hidden jewel in the mountains. It truly is. Amanda Runyon, uh, Assistant Professor of English, and uh, you do have a great uh, passion and love for reading, writing, literature, and we want to talk about the Pikeville Review. Uh, of course, uh, we talk about that. Those that aren't familiar first, what is the Pikeville Review? The Pikeville Review is a literary journal that uh, was started on campus and is um, sponsored from our humanities department. It started in 1982 and ran through 2006 and had a great readership. I mean, this was all over the place. This sure. is not just a campus publication. This is a publication all throughout the region. Um, we publish poetry, fiction, nonfiction. That's written, as we like to say, for, by, or about Appalachian people. Right. Um, so in 2006, the publication kind of went away. And last year, um, we decided to bring it back. So spring 2015, we published our first new issue. And now we're working on our second. We're really excited. Very good. Going back to 1982, prior to then, there was another publication as well. That's right. It was called Twigs and um, it was a, a great publication. I've seen a couple of copies of those old magazines, and that ran, um, I think I saw like a 1968 wow. issue, and then we had one that was published in the 70s. Um, the one that I looked at in particular had some poetry by Maureen Moorhead, who was the former Kentucky Poet Laureate. Right. So there are a lot of big names in Appalachian literature who actually got their start publishing through Pikeville College and Twigs and Pikeville sure. Review. Right. And uh, of course, that's every author's goal. That's right. Is to become published. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have to first be published somewhere. And many go on to great things. And we find that with the Pikeville Review as well. We're going to talk more about that. Uh, talk about the latest issue. Uh, submissions still being accepted? That's right. We're actually in our open submissions session right now. We run through December. So we're looking for any kind of entries of fiction, creative nonfiction, poetry, that um, basically anything creative mm -hmm. that we can then um, go through and compile a, a publication with. Very good. Mm -hmm. uh, poetry, fiction, nonfiction, whatever the case may be, uh, by or about Appalachian people. By, or, for, and about. Or mm -hmm. about Appalachian life. That's right. And That's I think right. any of the <laughs> authors that maybe grew up here that talk about things that took place in their growing up years, about their families. Uh, maybe they didn't grow up here, but they're writing about their families in Appalachia. Those That's are right. the type of things that would fit perfectly into this publication. Uh, submissions being accepted until December. Mm -hmm. How do they submit? You can actually submit uh, through email. We have an email address that's pikeforreview at upike.edu. All you have to do is send an attachment with a, a short little um, 
cover letter that says this is this is who I am and this is what my work is and it comes straight to us. Very good. Mm -hmm. And um, who judges those submissions and makes the decision of what will be published in the spring edition? Um, I have a co-editor, Chuck Johnson, and he and I will look through all of the submissions and um, that's the toughest job. We wish that we could publish everything we receive. Last year we had an amazing turnout of submissions. We had such a huge number. Um, and so that was the hardest part, was trying to decide what to go in. And of right. course, there are a lot of different factors that go into that, you know, how much room we have, sure. uh, things like that. So we do try to stick to some guidelines. Um, we ask that poets send up to five poems that we mm -hmm. can choose from, and that we ask if um, you're writing prose, so fiction or creative nonfiction, that you keep it to at least 5,000 words or under. That way it helps us get more in. Sure. Mm -hmm. Very good. And uh, how many uh, submissions were published last spring? Last spring we had submissions by about um, 37 different authors and now some of those were a couple of poems, some were one poem, some sure. were a couple, you know, a short story or so. Very good. So similar number uh, in the spring That's Pikeville right. Review. Amanda Runyon, Assistant Professor of English, our guest on this edition of Where the 99 Leads as we talk about the Pikeville Review a literary journal published by the University of Pikeville. Let's talk about the feedback that you've gotten from authors from last year's uh, uh, Pikeville Review and uh, those that have read as well. It's been wonderful. Um, I think when I first started, you know, I was really excited about being able to put this, this publication back together and get it back out there. But I didn't really, um, I didn't really expect the response I got to how many people had heard of or had read the Pikeville Review before. Sure. So I've received so many different um, comments from people who say, you know, we're really glad this is back. This was such a great publication. We had a reading here on campus last spring when the first issue came out and we had about nine of the contributors come in and read from their work that's published and so right. we had a great turnout from that. We've been in a lot of different places um, to promote the journal. We were at the Appalachian Studies Association Conference last March. Um, we recently, this fall, went to the Appalachian Symposium in Berea to promote the journal. So we've just, we've had a great response and, and readers have, have uh, given us some feedback and let us know, you know, exactly what they like, the authors that they like, what they want to see more of. We have a Facebook page that's pretty interactive, um, right. so we're getting a lot of great feedback there. Sure, and I would imagine there are people that uh, were able to read the Pikeville Review last spring that maybe read the Pikeville Review several years past. Right, right. Of course, glad that it's back mm -hmm. and uh, going strong again. And uh, we've talked about the history of this, and, and I ask, where can I read the Pikeville Review going back in history. And we've got a little difficulty with that. That's right. Um, right now we have an amazing archivist on our campus, Edna Fugit. She mm -hmm. does such great work to preserve college history, university history, and history from around the area, not sure. just ours. But before we had that, um, we didn't necessarily have a home for all of the past issues for the Pikeville Review. So we don't have all of those. Right. Um, we don't have copies of every issue that was released from 1982 to 2006, unfortunately. Right. And we do have some, and those are kept in special collections and archives on campus. Sure. So, you know, I would love if anybody out there. This is our call. Yes. <laughs> this is our call right now, because we know there are people that go back to mm -hmm. 1982 at the University of then Pikeville College that quite possibly could have their hands on one of them. That's right. If anybody that's watching or listening has a copy of a past Pikeville Review or a Twigs or any kind of journal from, uh, from the college years past, we would love to, um, you know, we would love to have it, but we would mostly love to look at it sure. and see, you know, and be able to compare some of that past work because, like I said, we, we have a pretty wonderful publishing history, you mm -hmm. know, so we would love to be able to sure. see some of that. And it could be someone that uh, <coughs> possibly was a student or associated with Pikeville College uh, in those days that may have their hands on that, that would want to make a donation That's to right. the archives at the University of Pikeville, and it would be so much appreciated. But the Pikeville Review, it's back, going strong, and uh, we talk about the types of works that you're looking for for this edition. You talked about poetry. You've talked about different types of fiction, uh, nonfiction, uh, about uh, Appalachia, mm -hmm. written by or for Appalachian people. Right. 
that's the type of thing. What are some things you've mentioned under 5,000 words? You've uh -huh. mentioned submit multiple poems. Uh, anything in particular you're looking for? You know, we're, we're pretty open when it comes to themes or, you know, topics that we write about. Um, Appalachian literature, you know, it's really, it's really tough to, to pin down when I say for, by, or about Appalachian people because, um, you know, it's not just about, I mean, we mentioned writing about your childhood and writing about those things, sure. but it's not just about that, you know. Appalachian studies and Appalachian literature is so very much a part of our lives now. You know, it's about the world around us now, not just in the past. So a lot of people are writing and um, they're writing things that are, are not necessarily what they would consider Appalachian, maybe not set in Appalachia or, you know, dealing with Appalachian themes, but with some sort of connection, those universal, those universal human uh, themes, you know, sure. so we're really open when it comes to, to theme. Um, we love, we get a lot of great poetry. I'm, I'm a fiction writer, so of course I love uh, some really strong fiction as well. Right. So we're, we're pretty open. We know that there are a lot of people out there who have some really great stories to tell in any form, so we'd love to read them. And uh, we know there are those great authors out there, and we've talked about the history of Twigs and the Pike Forward View, some great Appalachian authors uh, right. that got their start there this could be the start for those authors that are submitting even today. That's right. We're also really uh, passionate about publishing a mix of this last issue that we published. We had some pretty well-established authors, mm -hmm. but we also had some people who this was their first publication. Right. So we're really passionate about that, about putting all these different works together sure. so that we can see everything that's out there. And you're a writer. I am. And you've been published. I have. What does it feel like? as an author the first time you're published? Oh gosh, um, it's terrifying. <laughs> Sometimes it's terrifying because when you when you write, you write a lot of, you put your personality into it, you put sure. your emotions into it. And so you have that moment of, oh my gosh, now people are reading it, you right, know? Right. But then it's it's wonderful to know that our voices can be heard in this medium. And, and so it's such, it's almost like, I hate to use this analogy because it may sound silly, but it's, it's it, you know, it's it's like your baby. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you put so much effort and so much love and passion into these works. And so while it is terrifying, you know, sure. parenthood is terrifying too, right? right? But it's also wonderful to know that that you get to put this work out into right. the world and that it could actually mean something to somebody yeah. else. And just when someone makes a positive comment about one of your children, yeah, someone makes a comment about one of your works. That's right. Beaming mm -hmm. with pride, just the same. Absolutely. It is... Uh, it, like I said, it may sound silly, but it is pretty an accurate sure. analogy, I think, because it is something that you put so much of yourself into. And, I can see that. And it's a great, great thing. I think that expressing ourselves creatively is so right. important in so many ways. And so to give somebody a venue to do that, that's, um, I, I love to write and I love to publish, but I think the one thing I might love even more is to give other people that opportunity sure. as well. So that's why I love the work we're doing with the Pikeville Review. Yeah. because. Amanda Runyon, Assistant Professor of English at the University of Pike Fire Guest, and obviously, obviously someone who has found their right place in life. You have found your career. Absolutely. And, and it's one of those, they say that if you uh, find a career that you love, you'll never work a day in your life. And I think you found that because it's obvious your passion for reading and writing, yes. and you're involved in that every day. Uh, you're passionate about it. And I guess the next simple question is, why Appalachian lit literature and why is it so important? Oh gosh, um, there's so many reasons. I think, Andrew, that we live in an area that is so rich in culture and in history and in storytelling that um, it's just a shame not to tell those stories, right? Yeah. It's, such a, it's such a great place. Um, and like I said before, it's, it's hard when you give a certain genre or a certain type of literature a, a name, you know, right. because like with my work, it, you know, some works may be set in Appalachia, but have universal themes that you hope touch people all over the world. True. So, you know, although I consider myself an Appalachian writer, you know, I hope that people all over can read that. But I think it's really important for us to tell those stories. I mean, we talk about not keeping things, you know, that now we have this great archivist, but in the past we might have lost a, a few stories, and so that's why I think writing and, and keeping those uh, those stories alive are so important, so that we can remember where we've been and where we're going. Um, 
and art is such a great way for us to figure out the problems of the future. And so when you care so much about an area, and Appalachia is my passion, along with reading right. and writing. And so when you care about a, an area, I think that finding the art and telling the stories of that area is very important. How is Appalachian literature different than literature from other parts of the country or the world? Well, I think that you'll see a lot of different common themes in different type of literature that people will um, will classify. So when I teach Appalachian literature, we talk about sort of the three common waves of Appalachian literature. Um, you have different, even within Appalachian literature, you have different types of Appalachian literature. Sure. So you, you know, we had early on, you had people who were writing about, you know, just the nature, and so you see a lot of, of nature themes, and then you have the uh, the things that are happening in the area mirrored in the literature. So you get a lot of those, uh, the issues and, and also the wonderful things where you see a lot of, of common themes like ties to family sure. and ties to the land um, that are echoed in our literature as well. Yeah, Appalachian people sometimes are classified as clannish. Uh, do you find that in your reading uh, your writing of Appalachian literatures, do you find that to be true in some of those writings? I think I'd have to say yes. I think that, um, not in a negative way no. by any means, right. you know, but as as I think, when I think of the word clannish, I think about loyal, and I think that right. would be the word that I would, um, that I would use to describe it more so sure. than the even clannish. I think that we have a very strong sense of loyalty to our families and to our groups but also just to, to the area in general. Right. You call it loyalty. I think many of us that are from Appalachia, we look at it the same way. And some say that Appalachian people are slow to accept outsiders. And is that also tied to loyal to the region, the area where we grew up, our home place? Is it also tied to that in the slow to accept those from outside? Um, I think that I would probably classify that as being protective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that loyalty leads to a protective sure. feeling. And so I think in our history, you know, we've, had, we've experienced yes. some issues of people, not necessarily people, but organizations, anything you want to call coming in and, and maybe not always being the best thing for us. Sure. And so we, we are maybe a little bit more protective. Stealing our logs, stealing our minerals, stealing our land. Uh, it's part of our history and it's not any type of commentary. It's just, yeah. it has happened uh, in our region and it's a part of our history. And I'm sure it's, uh, it's in those writings, uh, yeah, especially writings from those eras. Mm -hmm. You'll see that as a, a pretty common theme. And you know, and it does get kind of outsider versus insider, but I, I like to consider it more of that protective, that loyalty, because we are fierce with our protective nature uh, when it comes to, to what makes us who we are, right? In this area, we are, I think Appalachians also have such a, a strong sense of place, you know, that we, and I know from personal experience, I can say that, and I've traveled a lot of different places, right? right? but this is home, this yeah. is where I, I'm passionate. And, and so I'm concerned not only with, you know, what I can do for my area, but how that area has helped make me who I am. And so we get very protective and yes. very, very fierce about it. So. Yeah. Amanda Runyon, Assistant Professor of English at the University of Pikeville, our guest today is we talk about the Pikeville Review, a publication from the University of Pikeville with Appalachian literature included. Uh, of course, the spring edition coming very soon. Accepting mm -hmm. submissions now through December. You can contact Amanda and we'll give you information how you can contact Amanda and make those submissions. But uh, we talk about other things. Uh, the academic team. I know that it's near and dear to your heart as well. Uh, we'll talk about the UPIC academic team and how this year's tournaments are going. This year has been so interesting and so fun with our academic team because we had such a huge turnover in the spring of last year. Um, almost, I think we have one Division I player left. The rest graduated in spring. Right. So, so we've had a whole new team. We got about 10 new freshmen on the team this year. So we've, we're working with all new fresh faces and it's just, it's been so fun and just such a new experience. Um, we have had, we've competed in two different competitions this semester, mm -hmm. but we're getting ready to host 
our annual uh, Kentucky Collegiate Quick Recall League tournament on UPike's campus right. on November 14th. Very good. So I'm really excited about that. This Saturday uh, on the 7th, we're actually volunteering, we're hosting a high school tournament called Too Smart for Drugs uh, academic team tournament that we do with is sponsored by Unite Pike. Yes. So we're hosting that. So we're really involved this year and getting out in a lot of different places and uh, meeting a lot of new people and having a lot of fun. Yeah. Talk about the makeup of the academic team at the University of Pike. Will you talk about new freshmen that have come in and we understand academic teams throughout high schools uh, in our region. Uh, very strong uh, academic teams in our region. Of your freshmen, the newcomers to the academic team, are they high school academic team members? Do you have some that are participating in academic team for the first time? We have a pretty good mix of both. We have some students who um, have been on academic teams since fifth grade, you right. know, and, and you get that a lot because I always say that with the academic team, you have to just love it, right? Sure. You're getting up early on Saturday mornings exactly. and, and extra studying. So you, so you get these students who just love it and have been on there since fifth grade. Um, but we do have quite a few who have just heard about it from friends who have been on the team and, and uh, have come out to practice and, and have had fun and, and joined the team. So we've had brand new players and pretty experienced players. Very good. We, uh, we love hearing about the academic teams. Also, you were recently uh, recognized by the Kentucky State Historical Records Advisory Board as you're implementing the use of source materials from Alara Library into your classes. Uh, how do you incorporate the archives from the Alara Library in literature and writing courses? Oh, um, so many ways. We have, um, I've already mentioned our archivist, Edna sure. Fugit. So she and I have just been working together to create new curriculum to get, you know, information about the archives and also local history into the classroom. Right. Um, in my Foundations of Writing course, it's, it's where we've had the most fun, I think. Um, we will have the students participate in a presentation and then we'll come down and she will talk about her job, basically, just how she preserves things and um, part of that presentation she talks about photographs because right. in the archives, you know, you get a lot of different things, but sure. photographs, that's kind of where everybody goes, you know, right. is look at the old pictures. So she'll show us some old pictures and talk about how sometimes she gets these pictures with no information, right. you know, and she, so she doesn't know who the people are, she doesn't know where it's taken or anything like that. But she has a pretty uh, good idea of how to use context clues in those photographs to tell yeah. her a time period, a location, sure. things like that. So, so she goes about that presentation and uh, gets the students involved in, in learning how to do this. It's a very, it's a, it's a form of research really. Right. And um, so then after their presentation, they then have an assignment where she gives them several photographs from the archives and they have to use those context clues that she talked about to create a scene and they have to write a creative narrative about what's happening in their picture. Right. So they have to try to figure out when was this taken, right. what what might these people be doing? You know, so she uses the skills that she uses as an archivist and we use our writing skills, you know, it's sure. a practice in writing. The, the students love it. It's a break from um, the traditional academic essay that they've been working on, a little bit of a chance to get creative. So they love it. Um, but then in the end, you know, we always have a discussion and, and ask questions of, of the students about how this affected them and the things that they've said like you know well I didn't even know what an archives was right. or you know they will go up and talk to Edna and say this is my picture um, do you think this was taken in Pikeville and she'll give them information and so they'll come back and say well you know I didn't know this about our history or you know I didn't I had no clue that this kind of thing might have happened here sure. so they've learned so much not only about writing but about our local history and, and about how to use those archives materials, you know, for any kind of research. Right. Um, in Appalachian Literature course, and has actually been my embedded librarian, so she works directly with my students um, on research projects. Sure. After they finish reading the literature for the semester, they have to conduct a research project about an Appalachian uh, theme that they found through the literature, and so they'll go through and, and find some historical documents that Edna has and, and be able to work that in. So Edna Fugit, 
is much like the grandmother's house of the <laughs> University of Pikeville because how many of us in our culture in Appalachia, when you go to grandmother's house, not only are there things mm -hmm. of historical significance from that particular family, and they seem to be collected at grandmother's house, but also there's always pictures. That's right. And I learned early on, on the back of those pictures, they're labeled with who they are because someone's memory is going to escape and at some point it has to be preserved. Edna does that with the University of Pikeville's collections, which is much more uh, mm -hmm. overwhelming than what grandmother's house would be. But uh, I think we all have those. We have those family collections or, or what have you. She's able to keep that alive, as many families are as well. She is. She's such an asset to, sure. to not just the university, but the entire area. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, she that information that she has is part of our collective history, our collective culture. Right. I know you and Edna work closely together when she's been a guest on the show. I always get excited because I find new things that are in collections mm -hmm. at the University of Pikeville and the Alara Library. Uh, how have the students received that, that type of work in the, their writing and courses and implementing the archives? They've just, they've loved it. Um, from the very time, we've been doing this project now for about two years, I think. And it, it never feels that, you know, at first they'll say, you want us to do what? You know, you want us to write something creative because they're used to writing academic essays. Yeah. And um, sometimes it's harder to be creative, right, than, than to write just what your instructor tells you sure. to write uh, or to write about. So, so it's a little bit harder. And so at first they're like, wow, I've never written, you know, because these are not students who have signed up for a creative writing course, right? right? But we use those skills, the narrative skills, the descriptive skills that we use in the essays all in this project. Um, but So sometimes they're a little skeptical at first, but it never fails that after the project is hands down their favorite project that we do throughout the entire semester. So we've we've had some great, uh, great responses. We've even had students who have gone back to the archives later on right. just to learn more things. Sure. Um, my students in my Foundations for Writing classes are actually working on this project right now. And so, you know, we've had several of them who will have gone up to Edna and said, you know, hey, I just want some more information. This right. is interesting to sure. me, you know. So, so it's great. It's a it's a win win. The students learn about the archives. They learn where they can go for some of that information. They learn about their local history. Mm -hmm. um, and even students who are not from here, you know, we mm -hmm. have a large amount of students from other places, but this is home for four years, you right. know. And so we want them to know about their home. Um, and then they practice their writing skills. So there's there's just no losing in this this project. I it's, can it's see great. it's sparking interest uh, indeed. Uh, Edna uh, Ed Fugit, of course, the archivist at the University of Pikeville. You can contact her, contact her at the Alara Library because I know there are many people that would love to see some of the things that are there, and that's why they're there. They're being preserved. Amanda Runyon, Assistant Professor of English, our guest on this edition of Where the 99 Leads, and still accepting submissions for the Pikeville Review. We want to give information. Amanda, uh, how can they make submissions? How could they get in touch with you uh, with any questions about guidelines or anything about the Pike Review? Okay, we have several ways that you can get in touch with us, as a matter of fact. We do um, have a page on the UPike website, and it's just www.upike.edu slash review, and you'll find all the submission guidelines there. They've yeah. all been updated for this year. You can find us on Facebook. If you're on Facebook, and a lot of people do social media, so we're just Pikeville Review, the Pikeville Review on Facebook. Or you can email us at pikevillereview at upike.edu. Or if you want to contact me directly, I'm Amanda Runyon at upike.edu. Very good. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being here again. Thank you for having me again. The love of reading and writing, and it is renewed in me every time you're on the show. Uh, Amanda Runyon, Assistant Professor of English at the University of Pikeville and a co-editor of the Pikeville Review and coach of the University of Pikeville academic team as well. Our guest on this edition of Where the 99 Leads. It's a program brought to you by the University of Pikeville, the leading university of Central Appalachia. Thanks for tuning in.